The question we're going to address in this video is how can we better understand identification in rhetorical scholarship? From this question, I think we can best see the intersection of identity discussion and rhetoric if we compare Frederick Nietzsche to Kenneth Burke. Let's start with Nietzsche since many of his ideas are the foundation of more contemporary scholars. Nietzsche is skeptical if we can affirm identity because of language's inadequacy to express reality. Nietzsche says every concept arises from the equation of unequal things. Just as it is certain that one leaf is never totally the same as another, so it is certain that the concept leaf is formed by arbitrarily discarding these individual differences and by forgetting the distinguishing aspects. We obtain the concept as we do the form by overlooking what is individual. Let's use Nietzsche's own example of the leaf to understand identity formation. If we have seen one leaf, we believe we know the substances of all leaves. So if we see a different leaf, we perceive it as a leaf and then can identify it as a leaf. We know these two leaves are not identical, but we can overlook their individual differences to see the concept of a leaf. To Nisha, we use rhetoric to create truths about our own identity, and in turn our truths are constructs from our own identity. He terms part of our language identity formation as anthropomorphism, where we shape things into a human being or give them human-like qualities to better understand them. Man's concepts and metaphors, or our drive to use anthropomorphism to misrepresent the world, are all we have. It's our way to create meaning and in turn develop our identity. Essentially, identity equals rhetoric, which is made up of concepts and metaphors plus anthropomorphism. Nietzsche's understanding of how we use rhetoric and language is one regarded as deliberately artistic and not natural. Our concepts, metaphors, and anthropomorphic language building is a dynamic social tool. We use rhetoric for survival and social purposes, or as a means of preserving the individual to understand ourselves and the world around us. In contemporary scholarship, we can see how Kenneth Burke looks at rhetorical discourse in creating identification in everyday language. We have two ranges in persuasion and identification. These overlaps of interest are termed ambiguities of substance. One can remain unique, an individual locus of motives. Thus, he is both joined and separate at once a distinct subject and consubstantial with another. What this means is that identification is a form of persuasion that influences our human relations, since to persuade we must also identify with other people, symbols, images, groups, and ideas. To do this, we become consubstantial, where two persons may be identified in terms of some principle they share in common, an identification that does not deny their distinctness. Burke gives the example of a politician saying, I was a farm boy myself. Identification is also compensatory to division. Because we experience separation biologically, socially, economically, and more, we try to compensate by identifying with others wherever our interests, values, attitudes, experiences, perceptions, and material properties are shared with others. Burke explains this as if men were not apart from one another, there would be no need for the rhetorician to proclaim their unity. To Burke, this process of identification is necessary for both the self and society, as our identif identity formation transcends into our sense of belonging in society. Another interesting point Burke makes about identification is that the audience and the individual self must both be persuaded. He states, the individual person, striving to form himself in accordance with the communicative norms that match the cooperative ways of his society, is by the same token concerned with the rhetoric of identification. Rhetoric acts not only upon an audience to persuade, but also acts upon the individual, which means we must internalize identification in order to persuade. A writer might have to identify with an audience's definition in order to persuade. For example, a professor discussing racism might ask her students to define gender. They might hypothetically answer male and female. The professor can use their definition of gender to ask more challenging questions, achieving consubstantiality with the students. If the professor persuades her students to move past their definition to see that gender is instead a, co a social construct, they are now identifying with her definition and are, ideally, consubstantial. Thus, identification and rhetoric is best seen by two markers as compensatory to division and consubstantial. Because we are trying to identify to create unity with division, we can use Burke's processes of identification to see power struggles between people, symbols, images, groups, and ideas, where in order for one to exist, another part must be excluded. To conclude, we can use and examine rhetoric to understand identity building in language, society, and ourselves. It's clear that our understanding of rhetoric and our understanding of how we use rhetoric will continue to be shaped by identification. Thanks for watching.